Welcome to Church at Home, and thank you for joining us today. So get settled in for a moment. Grab your devices and your Bible. We're going to start from the book of Acts again as we're talking through this series about the church. And so Acts chapter 2, we'll read again in verse 42 together. But I want to start with a question. And the question is, how well do you follow directions or instructions? Say, Mark, what kind of question is that to start with, you know, at church at home? Well, have you ever gotten so frustrated with a set of directions or instructions within your life that you made that decision? Now, you know what that decision is, right? And that decision is this. They have no idea what they're talking about. So I am going to do this all on my own. I'm going to do it my way. Some years ago, when Grayson, our oldest, was very young, that my dad and I built a wooden play set in our backyard. And so my dad is like a master carpenter. He is actually a genius at building. If I just could simply know the things that he has forgotten over the years because he's now in his 90s and you know he's, he's probably watching church at home with all of you today, that I would be great just to know those things that he's forgotten over the years. So we set out in, on this task. We open the box, we take out the instructions, and the instructions look like a chemistry textbook, you know, from school, and they're about as confusing as all of that. So we began to go through all of the parts and laid out the instructions, and we became very frustrated with the instructions, so we made that decision. Now, you know what that is, right? That we decided to embark upon our own, to set our own course through all of, of this instruction and building. So what we did is we, we just began to look at the picture on the box, is exactly what we did, and we began to build it by the picture on the box. And so we begin to assemble and disassemble at times. And, and we begin to realize that, well, their holes were all in the wrong places, so we had to drill our own holes. And so finally, at some point, we ended up with this product at the end. It doesn't quite look like what's on the box, you know? And it works, but it doesn't quite work as what they said, it, how they said it would work. But we come up with this product in the very end of all this. Have you ever done that with your own life? I think that's a huge question. You know, when we're talking about the church, have we seen that with the church also? Because when you look at the book of Acts, what we realize is that God has given us this blueprint for how the church should look for you and I. And what happened uh, many years ago, way before our time, that the church decided to rewrite the instruction manual to create something that sort of resembles this blueprint that we find in the book of Acts and, and sort of works, you know, pretty well and most of the time anyway. And, and, and so it sort of looks like if there was a box, kind of like the picture of the box. Here's what Acts chapter 2 says concerning the blueprint of the church. Acts 2 and verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So last week in our conversation together, that we talked about what the church looks like and we talked about who the church is. We discovered around somewhere around 313 A.D. that Constantine, when he legalizes Christianity, that the church decided to rewrite the instruction manual. This is exactly what they did. They moved away from Acts chapter 2, and they began to rewrite what the church should look like. Because prior to 313, the church was centered around a cause, and they were, it was built around a man, Christ Jesus, in that event of the resurrection. And so the church forgot those lessons that they had learned after the legalization of Christianity. They forgot the lessons they had learned under the persecution of the Romans. And so they simply transitioned to church, to a building or to a location or geography. The blueprint of the church is here in Acts chapter 2, and we just read that together. There's four commitments that we find from those early believers that give us really a blueprint or an instruction manual to build the church by. The first is this, and this is what we'll discuss this morning together. The first is to learn. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So that's what we're going to talk about today for a few moments together. And then the second one is to care for one another. The, the third is to fellowship or have community with one another. And the fourth would be to worship. But here is the thought. It's so human for you and I, isn't it, for us to forget lessons learned during those difficult times in our past. So as we reopen for, for worship here at Hope Fellowship on Sunday, June the 14th, 
Will we decide to continue rewriting the instruction manual? That's that we can easily do that, I think. Or will we trust the creator that he has a plan? Because from the very beginning of the church, it was planted in the heart of a human being. It was planted in the hearts of people. So what we realize is this, and the point is that you're the church, that I'm the church, that we as people, we're the church. It's not geography, but you and I, we are the church. And so can we, maybe for a moment, though, take this a little more personal? And you say, Mark, you always ask those questions. What are we going to, how are we going to answer back? Well, can we take this a little more personal for a few moments? Because when we use the church or the term church, I think it's somewhat ethereal in, in our life. So let's talk about the way you and I live. Because here is the thought that God gives us instructions, but you and I have this tendency in our lives at times to rewrite the instructions for our own benefit and come up with something that might resemble what we think God wanted, but it's not exactly how God really wanted to, create, to, to mold us into the person that he has designed us to become. So here is a thought as we begin this morning. It's a question. How do you perceive the teachings of Jesus? Because this is step one of the blueprint we find in Acts chapter 2. It's the apostles' teachings. It's what Jesus taught the apostles, and now the apostles are teaching those things to the New Testament believers. So back to our conversation about following instructions. Have you ever thought that the person that wrote the instructions had your best interest and your heart at mind? Have you ever given that thought? Yeah, it, it's a wild thought, but I know you need to kind of go through that, that they created the product, so they know they have actually seen the end result of the product, but we haven't, and you haven't. So have we given that thought? So let me illustrate it to you this way, that God has given us some instruction. He gives us instruction either through his word or he impresses upon our heart by the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to give you a little sidebar for a moment that those heart impressions, sometimes those can be misleading for you and I. Make sure that when God impresses something upon your heart, that it always simply is lined up with scripture. That is the way that you know that it is God speaking to you. So when God speaks to you, God says, hey, here's what I want you to do. These instructions require for you to use a screwdriver. And you say, okay, I have the screwdriver, but I don't want to wait in using the screwdriver because I don't have a lot of patience about what God is doing in my life right now. So I would rather choose the hammer because that gets things done quicker. My dad always called the hammer the persuader. And here's why he called the hammer the persuader, because it would simply persuade things to move that needed to be moved, but sometimes it would persuade things to move that didn't need to be moved. Or maybe God is speaking to you in your life, and he's saying, here's what you need. You need, you need a clamp. You need a vice. Because I want you to kind of sit right where you are, and I want you to allow me to work in your life in this situation. So I want you to make a stand in this situation. And he said, but God... That's not what I want. What I want right now, instead of a clamp and making a sense, I want a saw. I want a saw because I want out of this is what I want. I want to cut my way out of this in my life because things are not going the way I want them to go, so I want out. Or maybe God is speaking to you in his instruction and says, hey, here's what you have to use. You have to use a level. Here's what a level does. Uh, a level, it always tells the truth about kind of where you are. And so maybe God is saying to you, hey, the issue lies within you. Not the other person, but the issue lies within you. So you got to put a level on it. And you say, but I don't want to know what is really lying inside of me. So what I want to do is I want to move all, remove all the obstacles. So I'm going to really go big and I want some dynamite. I want something to simply explode this thing. And, and I, want, I want to take this into my own hands and work this, work this deal out. I don't want those obstacles to remain in my life. Here's the thought. Have you ever thought that God placed those obstacles there for you? Have you ever given it the thought that God placed those obstacles in your life for you to grow so that, here's the point, so that you would trust him? That is the point, that you would trust him. Do you trust the author of the instructions enough to follow them? That's huge. I think that's where we... You know, that's where we go wrong at times, that we distrust whoever wrote the instructions they give us, that we think, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Have you ever thought that you could trust the instructions enough to be patient, 
Do you believe that God's heart is for you and not against you? Do you see Jesus as the source of the joy of your life, or do you see him as some um, killjoy that simply wants to drain all the joy out of your life? Because when you go back and look at these, felt these believers in the book of Acts, the Bible says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were steadfast in that teaching. And so what is, what is it that the apostles taught them? It, he simply taught them about the life of Christ. It's what you and I know about the New Testament. They lived it, we read it. The ethical and practical teachings of Christ, the Christocentric teachings of the Old Testament, that is, those scriptures that point us to Christ. But the heart of the message of the apostles' teachings was always the gospel. And that's what makes it so powerful, I think, that these, these early believers, they struggle with the same tension that you and I struggle with, that there's always been and always will be in this world a disparity between that of the plan of God for our lives and what we think should be our plan. And why? Because God knows everything and sees all things that you and I struggle to see the next moment of our lives. We do. And so I quickly forget the lessons that I learned yesterday in my life, especially when today is better than yesterday. And so I forget those things. Let me give you some scripture. It's the book of Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. It's Paul speaking to you and I about this tension. And this is what he says, For I do not understand my own actions. Oh, we've said that before, or at least we felt that, right? For I do not do what I want, but I do... Um, I do the very thing that I hate, he says. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it but sin that dwells within me. Now, I stop for a moment to tell you, it's not that Paul is failing to take responsibility for his failures in life and his sin. It's not that at all. But what this is pointing out is his sinful nature. We keep on reading. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. What he's saying is this, I know what's right. I really believe that God has my best interest at heart. But I see in my members another law waging war against the laws of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's the, it's the already of our salvation and it's the not yet of our flesh in this life. It is. It's those moments when we know God's heart. It's those moments when we know that God is forced. This is Paul writing these things. That we know the ways of of God, this instruction of God is much better than our plan for our life or anything that we could ever come up with as far as a direction for our lives. But still, in place of picking up the, the screwdriver, when God says, that's what I want you to do, we take the hammer. Yeah, because I want to take things into my own hands. We find ourselves there so many times within our lives. That tension that is within us, and it will always be there as long as we are in this fleshly body, not the glorified body, when we're fleshly body, there's going to be that tension with our life. But then Paul says in verse 25, he says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Here's what he's saying, that this is Paul's personal experience. This is not some hypothetical illustration that he's given just to be relevant. It's not that at all. This is as real a struggle for Paul as it is for you and I. But he leans into Christ. He focuses his mind and his heart upon Christ is what he does. And then he says, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I begin, and I, I really, I, I focused on that statement. And I thought, what does God send you and I through his son? And I thought about this and it hit me. It's grace that he sends the Father sends through His Son to you and I in our lives, undeserving grace for us. It is the gospel story. It's the gospel story. It's exactly what the apostles are teaching the early believers in the book of Acts. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, and I quote, Religion is that I obey and therefore I am accepted. 
The gospel simply says this, that I, that I am accepted, therefore I obey. It's the message of the gospel. It's the story that you and I live right in the middle of, and it's also the story that you and I must share with others. You say, wait a minute, Mark, I like talking about this, you know, I like hearing about the gospel, but this thing about me sharing it with others, man, this is, this is a whole different story. It is. And, and what I realize is that it's a story that we must make known to others. Here's an important thought about the gospel. Is that there has always been two parts to the gospel story. I'm going to share those parts with you in a moment. But the second question I thought of this week is, what would Jesus have me to do with this information then? What does Jesus want me to do with all this information and this experience? Because you say to me, Mark, you know, I love hearing about the, the life, the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. But to, to think that unless I share the gospel, I share my grace story with other people, they may not hear about this, then, then that's a whole different thing for me. Can I, can I challenge you this morning? What is the first thing? that Jesus says after the resurrection to Mary at the tomb. I think that's where we start. In John 20 and 17, he says to her, do not cling to me, I have not yet ascended to the Father. That's not the command here, okay? We, we know that he, she's hanging on to her because she can't believe it's him, I think. But to go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. It's, it's the gospel story is exactly what it is. That what Jesus is saying to his disciples through his servant Mary is this, that my God is your God and my Father is your Father, that I have bridged the gap. I have fixed what was broken from the book of Genesis. I have kept the promise that I have made through grace. It's what the apostles communicate as part of the blueprint of the church. It's the instruction they give to the believers every day. It's that teaching of the apostles, the, what has happened in Christ's life through the New Testament and the ethical and those moral teachings of Christ, the, the Old Testament scriptures that point to Jesus. But the heart of that is the gospel message. And the two parts of the gospel message is first, information. Yes, it's absolutely information. But the second part is action. It's understanding the, the life and the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That is the gospel story. It is that and, and of grace. But yet the second part of this is action. And that is that you and I make that story known to others by telling it. That we have gospel conversations with our children, with our spouses, with our co-workers. For Reba and I, it's even now, it's, it's with our grandchildren with, with my Emma, with my Abby G, you know, with soon to be in our life, uh, baby girl, the, those that I have gospel conversations. It's during church here when we meet together in June, and it's at church in your home. The power of, gospel, the, power of the gospel is realized in a greater way in our life when we talk about it, and that's important. Because what I realize is the gospel did not originate within the walls of the church. It, it didn't, and it doesn't terminate within the walls of the church. When I look back what we talked about last week, that I, I go back to that moment with Matthew and Jesus, and, and what I, or Matthew, I'm sorry, in the book of Matthew, where Jesus is speaking to Peter, and, and what I realize he says to him, who Peter is this frightened disciple and follower of Christ, where he plants the seed of the church within his own life. That's a gospel conversation. And the book of Acts gives us the blueprint for that. It's part of you and I being the church. But I have this tension within my life to rewrite those instructions. I do. I want to be obedient, but there is this propensity within my life to sin. But then there's grace. That gift that simply God gives you and I through his son, Jesus, so that I don't have to be perfect in all of this because I'm covered in the perfection of God's son, Jesus. That's grace. That my motivation to obey is not done out of fear, but out of love. 
that my motivation to obey God is not done so I can get something from God, but I go to God to get God. And I think that's an important thing, that even when I obey, it, that, that life is not always going to go my way, and not everything is going to be perfect within my life. And I realize that during those times that God is growing me to trust Him in a greater way. You see, the apostles took great risk in teaching the, these these teachings of grace to those early believers. They're just chapters away from the stoning of Stephen. They've been persecuted not only by the Romans, but by the religious leaders of their day. It's not that they're the greatest leaders or the greatest speakers. It's not that at all. And history bears that out, I think, in many ways. But it's the message of the gospel. That you're saved by grace through faith, not of your own works. And the very faith that you have to believe that there is a grace that can cover the mistakes of your life is actually a gift of God itself. That you and I don't come to God. That we're drawn to God by his loving kindness, that God draws us to himself. It's not that I obey then God accepts me, but grace is simply this, and the gospel story is that I'm accepted and therefore I obey him. Listen, have these conversations. Have them in your home and in your car where you work, where you walk, you're the church. Here's the thing. You're the church, and the church should always have gospel conversations. But there are going to be times when you're going to be tempted to pick up the hammer when God says for you to pick up the screwdriver. There's going to be those moments in time in, in, your, in your life. And can I tell you, that's when you're covered by grace. So let me give you some practical aspects and thoughts this, this morning before we like tie all of this together. It's from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6 and verse 4. And here's what it says. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, that you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And you will bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on the gates. Three thoughts as we connect the dots this morning together. The first is this. It all starts in love. It all starts with loving God. Having gospel conversations always start with loving God. The motivator of all gospel conversations is love. Understand that. That no one's keeping score in all of this. The resurrection took care of that. Remember we talked about that, about our justification. It's not that at all. It's not about you having to teach morality to other people. It's not that at all. You point them to the cross. You point them to the cross. Understand that love arrests their heart. And as God loves on them and they love God, change happens in their lives just like it does in ours. But it all starts with love. Gospel conversations start with love. The second thought is this. Have these conversations in small moments of life. The writer in Deuteronomy says, talk of them when you're sitting in your house or when you're walking by the way or when you lie down or when you rise. Be the church wherever you are. That's the key. Be the church wherever you are. What I realize in reading the book of Acts, in Acts they have gospel conversations in the temple and they have gospel conversations in homes. That you have them here in a church location on campus. You have them at home, in your living room, while you're watching church at home. Because we are truly one church meeting in many locations. And the third thought, the power to save is not in your hands. Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says that our faith is not standing in the wisdom of man, but the power of God. And what I realize is this, that we have conversations and those things, those conversations are always coupled with trusting God. That you keep your eyes upon him, that this is all a sovereign work of his grace in people's lives and our lives, that it all centers on his love. So I challenge you today, read the instructions. Read the instructions that God has given you through the scriptures. His heart is for you and for his glory. Never forget that. It's for you and for his glory. Trust him. You are the church. You are the church. So the church 
should always be having gospel conversations. So for a moment, wherever you find yourself today, to just shut off all distractions, to close your eyes for a moment and allow me to pray with you. Father, I thank you that you challenge us in these times, in these trying and difficult and different times, as we seem to possibly see a light at the end of the tunnel or a moment to come back to some normal life, that we don't forget the things that we have learned. We don't forget the value of community, and we truly don't forget that we are the church and we're called to have gospel conversations with others. And it doesn't have to be a place or a location or geography, but we have these things maybe today, maybe this moment, God, that we have those things after this prayer in our home, in our living room with those around us. That we talk about the cross, we talk about grace, we talk about our struggles with this tension in our lives of your plan and our plan. And God, as we do that, oh, grace in our lives, the reality of that grace even becomes greater. So Lord, work in our hearts and our lives. May we be determined this week to have gospel conversations with others as we are the church. Thank you, Father, because it is your grace that covers those moments of our lives when we fail. And it's your grace that gives us the strength to have conversations with others. May we share our grace story with someone else today. In your name, amen.